looks like you guys have been here most of the day. So what I'll do is I'll make this relevant. And when I see your heads nodding, I'll know that's not relevant. Is that not always true? Okay. Uh, my name is Matt Beaudry, and I work for the Division of Emergency Management. Back in uh, 2005, at the end of the year, then Lieutenant Governor Gary Herbert went and toured Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, right after Hurricane Katrina. He came back and he said, you know, Utah's got a Katrina just waiting to happen, but it's an earthquake, not a hurricane. And that's when, uh, by his directive, the State uh, Department of Public Safety formed the Be Ready Utah program. So you might recognize this red bug up here. Uh, in the Be Ready Utah program, we have four pillar programs. One that focuses on preparing individuals, one that focuses on preparing communities, one that focuses on preparing schools, and I manage the program that focuses on business and private sector preparedness. So why am I here? Because nobody here works in the private sector, right? But I'm also responsible for a new program in our office called the Utah Public-Private Partnership, where uh, we're following a national trend of preparedness, a whole community preparedness initiative initiated by FEMA, the Department of Homeland Security to build preparedness down to every grassroots level that we can possibly find. To every individual, every family, every neighborhood, every stake, every ward, every business, <coughs> every business, okay? So one thing I wanna set the stage with for you to think about is that your business in the public sector and what you do is only as prepared as your employees. That's one of the biggest takeaways. Think about as we talk about some of these things, what does your critical operations look like if you only have 50% staffing because after an earthquake you can't find your critical employees, you can't get your people to work, that sort of thing, okay? So there's a lot of value in preparing your employees for this big one. And we have lots of other hazards besides the big one. But that's the one that's probably the most devastating when you have for. Sure, there's room and content spires. There's flooding. I saw the presentation from one of your presenters earlier. So whether it's a sprinkler head goes crazy, or a pipe burst, or even our regional seasonal flooding that we get. Okay? Maybe it doesn't just impact your building, maybe it impacts the infrastructure that your building relies upon. Electricity, natural gas, wastewater, and those sorts of things. All right? So where I fill in with this is I interface with private sector and public sector and recognize that, as you well know, you've got some frank dependencies on the private sector, namely Rocky Mountain Power and Questar Gas, unless you've got a relationship with a local UAMS provider like Murray City, Bountiful City, Provo City, and some of the others that generate their own electricity periodically, okay? So you've got that interdependency, and that's what my program is all about. So what I hope to cover today is some bread and butter stuff. You're gonna walk out of this presentation, you're going to say, Matt, that wasn't very sexy. It didn't really teach me anything I didn't already know. Well, that's the thing. Although we have generational preparedness culture in Utah, we're just not as prepared as we think we are. And we see it over and over again, all right? So that's why the governor still says, hey, we want you to go out and remind people about the, the bread and butter, the basics of preparedness. So I hope we'll do it justice today. Try to, the presentation that's in the the, this book is not what I'm going to use today. It's most of it, but I added a few slides. So I told Tom I would send him the updated version you're going to see this afternoon, and then he'll forward it out to you, right, Tom? Okay. So this is you. You got a lot to be responsible for. Not just the structures, but the infrastructure. And you have a very important role in your organization's continuity of operations. Blurred out for me what you represent, what facilities are represented in this room. Is blurred now. Is it all of them in your jurisdiction? Is it just wastewater, warehouse, road shed? Okay, big one, admin building. If there's a big one and your people need to come into work, they need a place to come into work. And everything that comes with it, you need to communicate by phone, by cell, by fax, and by internet. Okay? Who else? Sheriff's, Sheriff's Office, Corrections, who else? Health Department. Health Department, huge, after large-scale disaster. Who else, guys? The EOC. The EOC. 
Yes, critical. What county are you with? Duchenne County. Okay, good. So after a big one, wherever it's at in this state, whatever it means, you guys have got a role in the continuity of operations of your organization. And there's a lot of work that those folks need to do. So let's cover some of the things. You're responsible for all aspects of buildings, I should have said, as well as the land that it's on. You need to be aware of the external hazards. Are you in a floodplain, near a floodplain, near that seasonal runoff that's going to have the 300 year event this year? Probably not this year, okay? But maybe some other year, right? Uh, are you near a fault line? How many know? Are you within 10 miles of a fault line? Every hand in this room should probably go up, right? Just about all of you are. 85% of the state's population and the state's businesses reside within 10 miles of these dozens of, so far, known fault lines. The question we can't foresee, unlike a hurricane, is when, where, how big, we just don't know that. And so rather than become complacent and say, well, it's never happened in my lifetime except for that weird one out in Wells, you know, way back when, um, that's not okay. Okay. We know that we live in a seismically active state. Uh, who can tell me on average how many earthquakes we have in Utah every day? Take a stab. 50. 50. Great number. You do your homework. It's about 50. Yeah, well, it's not going to fracking. That's Oklahoma's problem, okay? Um, but the good news is, is most of our earthquakes, and you're right, it's about 50. I've seen it as high as 80. I've seen it as low as 30, so let's split the difference, okay? But they're all small. But that does tell us that we're seismically active. And so the potential is there on any given day. It just needs to have the right combinations of pressure, location, depth, magnitude, okay? You're responsible for everything that comes into your building that we talked about, the utilities, um, the ability to communicate, transportation infrastructure, roads, garages, the building that you park your vehicles in, the building that you house your servers in, the buildings that you do your utilities in. Okay? And they all have a responsibility to be maintained and kept up to date and be safe. Is it power, water? I'm gonna talk about a BORP right now. Who knows what a BORP is? Anybody heard of it? Anyone here from Murray? That's all county, right? Sorry. Oh, What's that? I'm and I'm just saying they have a lot of corpses in there. <laughs> All right, a board. <coughs> Building occupancy resumption plan. Who's going to come inspect your building and vet it for safety and tenability after an earthquake? Tell me, who is that that comes and inspects your building before someone can go back inside? It's a building inspector. It's probably in your county ordinances, okay? San Francisco it also has an earthquake hazard. They were the first city in the nation to develop a building occupancy resumption plan. And they recognized that after an earthquake, there's only a finite number of building inspectors, public building inspectors, that can come and inspect a building after an earthquake. That means there's going to be long lines and long waits for you to have a public building inspector get to your building, inspect it, vet it, prove it's safe. No one wants to wait that long. You cannot wait that long. So what we do with the idea of a BORP, and so far there's two cities in Utah that have adopted the occupancy resumption program. Salt Lake was the first. Murray was the second. This is a seed I'd like to plant with you folks and have you take it back to your administrators. We talk about getting a BORP on your county ordinances because that's what it will require. In simplicity, and I'll kind of flip through these slides really quick, these were developed by the, the then president of the Utah Structural Engineers Association, a guy named Brent Maxfield. Brent works for the LDS Church. He's a structural engineer, okay? But he was also the president of the uh, USEA uh, at the time this was developed. And uh, the idea is, is that you would hire a private building inspector, a, a structural engineer, an agreed upon expert with your building department. How do I get this full screen? Or is it already full screen? Oh, here we go. I got it. Okay. Hire a professional structural engineer in accordance and agreement with your building department to come and pre inspect your building while you've got the luxury of time. Then, after the big one, instead of waiting in line for the finite number of inspectors, you've already got your pre inspect on file with the building department. 
bring back that same inspector, that same private engineer, that same firm, okay, and have them post inspect your building after the incident. Green tag it if they can, hopefully. Red tag it, hopefully not. But conduct the inspection instead of waiting potentially days, okay, to get an inspector out to your facilities because by law you're not allowed to have people go back into it until it's deemed safe. Am I right? You have, am I right or do you know? What would be a major what, what would qualify for that? If we have 50 of them a day, can't have canals. Well, no, I understand that, but I think you're going to recognize when your building's been shook pretty hard. Yeah. Right. And you're going to know. Well, yeah, this, in our building, we had that happen. We were in a major place in Earthquake, not in any time. But uh, source of it, our building didn't settle until a couple years after. Mm. Okay. So, and now we've got cracks in it. Yeah, I suppose there's lots of unforeseen possibilities. I'm talking about the obvious untenant or structural concern of your buildings. And you'll know when there is one. You'll see cracks or things will have fallen over or they'll be listing. You know, they're not plumb and they're not right. And you'll know. In that moment, bring in that same person in Andy for a post inspect and have it filed with the building department. If you're green tagged, you're ready to go instead of waiting in line. And there's the value of the board. If you want more information on that, I can send it to you and I can put you in touch with the guy that wrote this program, okay? Um, because it's gonna save you a ton of time. Any questions about the board? Okay, I can put you in touch with those guys, like I said. There we go. Sorry, Tom, gotta do it my way. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, the board we've talked about critical environments, server rooms with racks and racks and racks of sensitive computer equipment. They need air conditioning. They'll need water to run those air conditioners and the chilling units. So when we talk about critical environments, that's what we're talking about. Rooms that have to stay cold and rooms that have to stay the right temperature. How about securing fall hazards? So you may have some of the stuff in your buildings. I didn't put up pictures of forklift racks and racking systems, but you get the idea. This is the easiest fix you have in all of your buildings right now, is how to secure fall hazards that can hurt or kill people if they fall over or fall off, uh, or damage or ruin expensive equipment, and, or even damage your facilities. So this is another easy fix for you to go back and secure this stuff so because we don't know when it's going to happen and when this stuff is going to fall over. And these are just some minor ones. I mean, everyone's home has got this strap around your hot water tank, and I'm sure your buildings do too. And I'm sure most of your buildings have some version of filing cabinets and these expensive pieces of equipment. Um, so you want to think about securing those so that it doesn't become costly or damage a person or cost in their life. Your role after the big one are what I put up here, and probably a lot more that you know better than I do. Some of the stuff that's in your buildings requires a systematic uh, sequence to safely shut things down, to properly shut it down. Think about boilers, think about computer equipment, and sensitive uh, pieces of equipment like that. So you have a responsibility, you or your staff, to get people out of the building for safety's sake, if that's the case, turn all this stuff off, make sure that we didn't leave the gas on, and then it finds an ignition source, and then we have another disaster on top of the one we're trying to deal with. So avoid second disasters by turning off utilities appropriately. What about all your backup systems, backup generators? How often do you test the fuel? Is it often enough? Uh, your emergency lighting systems. And we'll talk about emergency communication systems in So I'm going to get into another part of this PowerPoint in a minute. I'm going to talk about you are subject matter experts in your team where you work. You're specialists in what you know, what you're responsible for, and what you do. Just like the business office manager is, just like the commissioners are, just like the IT manager is. You've got lots and lots of specialists and as facility managers and people responsible for the facilities. You're one of those managers. 
We recommend that all businesses, and you're a business, that your business bring together a team of experts and conduct hazard and vulnerability assessments for all of your facilities. Talk about that in a minute. Also conduct business impact analysis. That's a BIA, and I'll show you that in a minute as well. These are two simple tools that you look at to analyze what are the likely hazards to our facilities, what are our vulnerabilities to those hazards, and I'll even show you a worksheet you can use, a simple template to kind of add up the numbers and start ranking your hazards and your vulnerabilities to those hazards, and also recognizing what are the impacts of our vulnerabilities? What could the impacts be on our people, on our facilities, on our equipment, on our supply chain? Okay. How many are in the room are responsible for fuel as well? Anybody here responsible for the fuel management for your fleet? Nobody? Okay. All right. Will you want to consider identifying alternate facilities to do business out of in the event that your buildings are untenable? That's smart planning. You have the luxury, at least we think we have the luxury of time right now. You want to hire a realtor to go out and find the specifications you're looking for in the geographic areas that you're looking for? Or do you already have your eyes on those short list of buildings that might fill the bill when the buildings you're in can't be used? So think about alternate facilities. Do we only need them for a short time, forever? Do we want to just plan on staying there until we build a new one? Um, do we only need a certain number of buildings, or do we, should we start looking at all of our buildings? Would you consider doing business with someone else, co-locating in their facility that was still tenable? So I put competitor. You guys don't really have competitors. This is more geared towards private sector, right? But we see private sector companies doing that all the time. They recognize that they have hazards that they're vulnerable to, and in the rare event that they might not be able to get back into their buildings where they do business, would they consider pairing up with a competitor so that it's a win-win? Yeah, I've got some companies that end up doing that, actually. On this topic right here, how redundant do you need to be in the resources that you're responsible for? So an easy topic to talk about on this one is electrical power. So backup generators, that's an easy fix. One of the takeaways, my first takeaway I gave you was your business is only as prepared as your employees are. Here's another takeaway I'm going to give you. Eliminate single points of failure. So when you conduct your hazard and vulnerability assessments, go around and look at what you're responsible for. Hey, you can give other areas ideas, as you see them, where you need to eliminate single points of failure. So here's a simple one that you might re resonate with. How many of you, and I'm going to pick on you because you're right here, are the guy in your organization that has these and nobody else has them? How many of you? That's only just two or three? Typically a lot more than that. What happens if we can't find this guy after the big one? <laughs> you just got out of Sorry. You're busted. So you see my point. That's a great example of a single point of failure. In most organizations, there's that one essential person that's got all the keys. They know where all the secret spaces and special switches are, how to hold your mouth just right to get that blower to fire up, right? <laughs> Things like that. That's a single point of failure. And you need to look at eliminating those in the event that after the big one, that critical resource cannot be accessed, cannot be used. Okay? Another thing I think is a huge takeaway is get to know your local responders. And if you've drilled with the fire department, great. If you haven't, go find them and drill with them. What about the police department? Why in the world would you need the police department to come into your building and get familiar with it? Because more and more people are coming back to work with guns, shooting up fellow employees or their former boss. So the need for familiarity with your first responders, with the layout of your building, your safe spaces, time and space save lives when it comes to a workplace violence incident with a gun, the active shooter problem. And it's not just happening somewhere else. Okay? It's happening everywhere, every day. And it could happen at your place. A disgruntled employee that was let go, not happy with the situation. Lots of things I could think of that can cause that problem. And it's a hazard that everybody in this room should be thinking about. So the value of getting to know your first responders, and more importantly, them coming to your sites and getting to understand them, because they're going to be the first ones to show up. Where's the FDC? Where's the hydrant? Okay, where's the, you know, the um, alarm box? And for the cops, it's 
where are all your spaces? Where do we come in? Where's your command post? Where are your rally points for your employees? They want to know your plan because it's their safety just as much as yours. So please get to know your local responders. Now, this thing I'll say a whole bunch. If you kind of have plans and know they have plans. Okay, just about everybody. So by show of hands, how many have looked at your plans in the last six months? Well, good. Good for you. Okay? I don't usually get that kind of response. Knowing your plan is great. Testing your plan is just as essential. Um, I really preach exercise, not Gold's Gym exercise, but exercising your plan. Because it's great to know what we did good, what we thought out well. It's more important to find the gaps. Because lives can be in the balance, a lot of money can be in the balance, and the continuity of the critical role that your company, your county, plays in certain community uh, could be at stake. So test your plans, find your vulnerabilities. All right, so here's where I'm going to get into the presentation I usually give. So you're going to forgive me, but for the sake of you sitting down all day, I'm going to kind of flip through a lot of this pretty quick. If you've got questions, please blur them out. If you've got something to say, please let me know. Uh, I understand it's been a long day, and like good students, no one's going to say anything. I get that. So uh, you know, I'll, I'll make it quick, but we'll make it relevant. So on this page, you see photographs depicting hazards that all your businesses are vulnerable. Yeah, even the tornado. We just had the 15-year anniversary of the Salt Lake City tornado last year, right? So whether it's a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, like the active shooter we were talking about. And what about this disaster? Does it impact U.S. facilities and managers? Darn right it does. It's a tidal wave. It's a tidal wave that the whole country is trying to wrap their head around. I was just listening to the radio on the way down here. Uh, how many heard about the hack two weeks ago of Anthem Insurance, the uh, umbrella company that manages all the Blue Cross and Blue Shield insurance plans around the country. They were hacked. They originally thought it was 80 million files. Today, they just released information that could be closer to 100 million files. Okay. The target data breach. Remember two years ago almost now, a no, year and a half ago, right after Christmas? Target announced that right after the Christmas shopping season, they've been hacked for 20 million files. Okay. Anyone want to guess how they got into Target's database? Through a remote control HVAC system. And that's how they found their way in. In this interconnected digital world, these people are pretty darn creative. And they've been forensically looking at the Target breach ever since it occurred, and just recently announced to us in a DHS uh, data call that they discerned that they got into an HVAC system that was remotely controlled. Okay. You have something like that in your facilities? Something to think about. I'm sure your ID department is all over it. Not. It's impossible to keep up with. It's like the machine gun fire a couple years ago. Off to the races, 50 mile an hour winds, and we don't possibly have enough resources to keep up with this cybersecurity problem. We're chasing and chasing and chasing. So, if you're interested, I've got some experts that I bring to companies that talk about cybersecurity. Things like social engineering. Anyone know what social engineering means? It means teach your people that don't open emails and attachments, they don't know what they are. That's social engineering. It's teaching people how to be smarter about how they use computers and the technology. So they talk about social engineering, they talk about systems hardening, lots of things. If you're interested in that, let me know. It's killer presentation and can make a big difference in the continuity of your facilities just from that perspective. So what we see here is all the hazards that we're faced with in Utah. Not all these pictures came out of Utah, by the way, but those are the real ones for us, natural and man-made. This is ours. Okay. So I don't know if you live in this area or if you live down work down in Utah County or up in Davis and Weber counties. Those red lines are the fault lines, and they're everywhere. They're up in the mountains, too. They're down by St. George as well. Our state is fraught with these uh, fault lines. The pink shaded areas are different severities of liquefaction. Liquefaction is water content in the ground that rises under pressure with the plates doing this, like an accordion and moving water to the least point of resistance, and that's the surface. And it will have an effect on your foundations, on your pillars, 
okay, on everything you think is secure. The thing we don't know is how severe will that impact be. So that's why we preach and preach and preach incessantly mitigation. Retro update your buildings if you've got the money. Identify the ones you should. You know, we started with schools. That was an easy one to pick. Schools need to be retrofitted for earthquake standards. Okay? But where do you start? Because this isn't the only area that's got fault line and liquefaction issues. But those are the big hazards that we're faced with and a lot of vulnerability that goes along with it. So quickly, what's in it for us? Now, this is not you necessarily as the public sector, but statistically, we know from looking at Katrina and Superstorm Sandy and the seasonal tornadoes that are getting more and more devastating, that one out of every four businesses, and let's just say facilities, doesn't reopen, owing to a lack of preparation. Now, that's nobody's fault. That's just a good reality. We have a good mindfulness now that, and Utah's a, a good example of the real problem. And we've seen it over the past, what, five, six, and even longer years. More and more people are streaming into this beautiful place. So we're densifying our residential populations. We're densifying our business populations. We've got more buildings going up. Many of you, like me, probably drive around and say, who ever thought they should build there? Yeah? Well, all the good land's already been picked. So now we're going to the second, third, and fourth best places. And those come with hazards and vulnerabilities. But the thing is, is one out of four facilities will close after a big disaster. And of the, those that make it, half of those over the next few years limp along might go out of business as well. Again, that's not you. But it emphasizes the problem that we face. Here's a quick continuum of the problem. And what it, gra what it uh, points out really well is we can take steps ahead of time. That's called mitigation. To make this shallower and make it shorter. And that's what we want to talk about today. That's what I want you to go back as the subject matter expert on facilities and start talking to your team about. Okay? How can we take steps now to shorten that depth of that chasm and shorten the length of that chasm and get back to normal operations as quickly as possible? Hopefully you got a better plan than that, right? Okay, but a lot of people don't. But that's a good place to figure that out. Start somewhere. So we'll get through this part really quick. Make a team. It should be all the experts in your organization. You're the expert on facilities. Pull your team together. Make sure it also includes maybe people that are on retainer or are temporary contractual experts, consultants, and that sort of thing. You have to consider any legal or regulatory issues when it comes to building your plan. So you've got a lot to think about, and the whole team will help think about it. Excuse me, think about everything. This is where we get into the HVA. Identify the hazards, identify your vulnerability to the hazards. Natural hazards, man made hazards. How do you know your vulnerability? Well, some of you have been there long enough, you've got a history. You know that you're maybe close to the floodplain. You know that you might be in proximity to a fall line. Or next to that big building that's probably going to come down when the ground stops shaking or the floor. It's going to fall on your earth. All right, so those are all the kinds of hazards we're asking you to look at. That would be a great example of a cascading effect. Your building is unimpacted, but your neighbor's building fell on yours, and now it's impacted. Cascading. What assets in your facilities are at risk? People, number one, equipment, and other things that you store, supplies, that sort of thing. So what would the impact of these hazards that you've identified and your vulnerability to these hazards? What would that impact be on those assets? Well, you can always hire more people, right? They hired you one day. I'm just kidding. So you, you see my point. We want to look at the things that are true assets to the organization and start looking at how can we blunt the real sharp edge of the hazards. That's mitigation. Now the other thing is things change with time. Maybe you've got more facilities than you did when you originally conducted your first HVA and DIA. Maybe you've added on to the building. You've got more employees. You've got more stored in those buildings in terms of inventory. You've got more vehicles stored in the barns. I don't know what you do. So the point is, every periodically reassess the HVA because things change with time. So here's the idea of the business impact analysis. And the overarching message, which I already shared with you, is eliminate single points of failure. Identify your hazards. Identify your vulnerabilities. Look at the risks. 
the assets that are at risk according to your hazards and vulnerabilities, what would the impacts be? I mean, you're not going to lose customers. You're locked up that way. But in the private sector, they are worried about losing customers to their competitors, losing reputation because they can't fill orders. All right. So take a global look at what oops, what would the impacts be based on the HVA that you've done. When you marry up the findings of an HVA and a BIA, you start to get numbers that rise above other numbers because it's just a mathematical equation. And you'll start, they'll start to identify the priorities themselves. The higher the number, probably the higher the priority for you to mitigate. Because you've ranked impact on people, property, your inventory, and even your supply chain for that matter. Okay. Questions about an HBA and BIA. Alright. I already touched on this one, the guy with the keys, uh, but more importantly, the decision maker. Build bench depth in all of your critical operations. If you're the only one in your organization that's empowered and knowledgeable to make these critical decisions after the incident, then you need to coach up some, uh, some subordinates, some replacements, in case you can't be there, in case they can't find you, the number one guy, but they can find your backup, okay? So build some bench depth. We like the 3 B principle. And they need to know what they're empowered to do, and how to do it, and when to do it, and what to do it with. And that is not going to happen overnight. But see, right now we have the luxury of time. And that's simple continuity planning right there. Eliminating the single point of failure. Then determine what are your essential functions. Blur them out for me. I mean, the must-haves. You can get by without doing a lot of stuff. But what are some of the things that you've got to do? Just tell me. Pay taxes. <laughs> well, that one might slide for a couple of weeks okay, while we get back to normal. But in your role as facilities managers or the facilities that you manage, what are the critical functions that your county business must have intact or quickly bring back up to speed to keep doing the critical job that they're supposed to do? Power, water, sewer. Yeah, everybody thinks about water and it's it's water out of the tap. The way more important one is the water that goes down the bowl. Because if you can't do that, we've got a much bigger problem. And you guys get that really well. Most people don't get that. So identify what your essential functions are, the ones that you have a responsibility for. And what are you going to do? How long can you not do business? Well, not very long. You're the county. The county's got a critical role in restoration of services, and recovery of the whole community and everything that the county provides the community. And you've got a key role in that. Comment? No? Okay. You guys don't worry too much about this stuff, okay? But there's people on your team that will. And that's why I'd be happy to come out and talk to your management team about this that I'm showing you. So this might be the takeaway I ask you to take back to the home office and say, hey, this guy can spend an hour with us and kind of coach us up on some things we should think about. That's about how long it takes, 45 minutes to an hour, okay, unless we get checked, which is a good idea. So again, big takeaway. After identifying the critical ones, people, equipment, services like the internet connectivity, the ability to answer the phone, the ability to make phone calls, that's a big part of what the county's going to do after the big one. And you're going to have some role in making sure there's some contingencies there. So eliminate single points of failure, have backup points. You know, there's a great story. St. Mark's Hospital in Salt Lake City, they make phone calls by the thousands every day. Families want to talk to loved ones that are in the hospital. Surgeons need to consult with other physicians, that sort of thing. And it's literally one afternoon, their phone system just went dead, gone. No dial tone, no nothing. Fortunately, their continuity planner had foreseen that possibility as a hazard, as a vulnerability, as a single point of failure. So they went to their CEO and they said, you know, just in case our phone system dies, because it's happened, not to us, but others, how about we pay a subscription fee for a backup phone plan? And it was a multiple platform phone plan. It was voiceover protocol, it was you know, a bunch of things, Sat satellite connected, had a lot of redundancy in it. And I forget the subscription, but it didn't want really to kick into a higher fee until they actually activated it. Well, that moment came. Loved ones still need to hear from their families. 
Surgeons still needed to consult over the phone. They went into their control center and they flipped a switch. And guess what? They had phone service again. The guy's comment when he told the story, we would have paid 10 times over and it would have been well worth it. It meant so much to the continuity of our operations. So when we look at single points of failure, is communications one? Yes, for sure. Because we know from studying disaster, and I, I get my geek on studying disasters because that's my passion. We know from studying Katrina and Sandy and others around the world, okay, the first two things that swirl the drain are the ability to communicate and the ability to move transportation. And since our biggest hazard is an earthquake, that can never be more amplified. We don't know how surface roads and overpasses and bridges, big or small, are going to be impacted. And so the ability to communicate is a big hazard. Build redundancy in your ability to communicate. Uh, transportation, it's kind of up to you, Doc, but it's also kind of up to your county folks that are responsible for roads. I don't know about you, but here's, a, here's an easy contingency plan. Go back and tomorrow you talk to all the people you work with, plant this seed. You come back to work on Monday, let's talk about the three alternative ways you get to work when your primary way isn't passable. Simple contingency plan. Okay. Have redundancy and just the ability to get to work. Yeah, it might take you twice as long. It's probably only a good excuse after the emergency, not every day and showing up late to work, okay? But anyway, easy stuff to start taking care of. Now this one doesn't affect you so much, but maybe it does. Who do you need to communicate with? Well, who are your audiences? A lot of people are going on no after the ground stops shaking. How are you guys doing? You doing all right? All right. Um, so identify your audiences and what are they going to want to know and have answers already prescripted. This is really more relevant to the private sector because they rely on keeping their customers happy. But maybe this applies to you because you do have a supply chain. Who are the suppliers and the service providers that you rely on? And how prepared are they? So here's another simple redundancy. Maybe you identify a second and a third provider. Maybe you've done business with that same company that provides you those essential chemicals or widgets or whatever. And some of those suppliers, you don't have any redundancy. There's no answer for when Rocky Mountain Power goes down, really. There is no answer for when Questar goes down, really. <coughs> and they're aware of that. They, they're a regulated industry, and they're required to have some uh, contingencies to get back up really quick, and I've talked with them a lot, and they know as quick as they can. But talk about, uh, talk to your suppliers. How vulnerable are they? Likely, you, they're in the same geographic area that's going to be impacted that you're in, because right? that's how we do business with locals, right? At least you're encouraged to. Maybe you should consider brokering an agreement with someone outside the impacted area, or the possible impacted area, as a contingency, but you get to decide. Should you consider uh, contingencies in terms of hardware, like a satellite phone? Probably a lot of you use radios, I'm guessing. Uh, we know that the cell towers are going to go down. Uh, you know, there was an earthquake, what, two years ago in Virginia, right outside Washington, D.C., and it shook the ground. I think it was like a four or something, as I recall. Didn't kill anybody, didn't break anything. It put a crack in the Washington Monument, and they spent two years repairing the Washington Monument. That was as bad as it got. But because everybody was on the cell phone, you okay, I'm okay, kids okay, yeah, check out the school, yeah, the building's still up, the school is filling orders. Cell system was down for six hours because it was overwhelmed with the volume of cell phone traffic. So here's another takeaway. If you haven't written it into your plan, one of the best contingencies for dealing with the inevitable failure of the cell system, text instead of voice. Much less of a burden, much more likely that your messaging is going to get through. All right, so here's one you're really going to like, because most of you are my age or older, and some of you aren't. So what I'm going to show you here, just to show you uh, the power of social media. How many use social media? Twitter, Facebook, and such. There was an earthquake off the coast of Japan just about a year, uh, well, four years ago, March 2011. Caused a huge tsunami. We all saw it, watched it. It was amazing. What you're going to see here is you're going to see Twitter traffic emanating out of this area was affected because phone lines were down. There was no internet, but for some weird reason they could still tweet. Okay? Go figure. It's a contingent method of communicating. So here you had family members tweeting family members 
in the same continent, in the same hemisphere, and beyond around the world, I'm okay, we're okay. And then you saw businesses tweeting saying, the office is collapsed and on fire. I can't find half the employees. Or, we're all okay. I've accounted for all the employees. And blah, blah, blah. Whatever the message was. The pink lines are going to be the outbound messages. Look at the volume and the scale of the green lines that are the retweets. I don't know how to get this thing going right here. Yeah, let's try this. Here we go. Pink is original message. Green is retweeted message. I like showing this because it really shows the, the reach of social media, and in this case, it's Twitter. In the emergency management industry, we recognize that Twitter is a great tool for providing real-time information, real ground truth. People that are right there in the crash, tweeting pictures, and tweeting videos, and tweeting information and updates. We have a seat in our state DOC that does nothing but have two people monitor social media. Twitter, Facebook, and others, Instagram, okay? And we watch the trends from all the eyes out there seeing it as it happens. Not trying to catch the cops, because they're busy. Not trying to find the firefighters, they're busy. Okay? So is there value in you integrating more social media? Maybe not for you as facilities managers, but for your organization as a whole. And I'll bet your public affairs or public information officer is pretty dialed into this idea. When you have your planning team get together, talk about how do we use social media as a team to communicate if our cell phones don't work, if our landlines don't work, if we can't email, but maybe we can tweet. Have you pre-identified a hashtag? That's how we make channels, as it were. You want a channel for Davis County Sheriff's Office? They already have it. You want a channel for Duchesne County Public Works? Make one. It's hashtag whatever you make it. That's how you make the channel. And then you already know, because you've identified it in your plan, this would be one contingency way we can communicate when all others that we normally use fail. Simple contingency plan. Okay? That's all we're talking about here. Any questions about that? Kind of impressive. You want to see it again? No, I'm going to get you out of here. All right, more, uh, more information on the same idea. Identify your critical supply needs. What are they? You guys, some of the things you must have. Uh, do you all work in a real time, or sorry, uh, just in time inventory method? Most companies do. You know, we got away from stockpiling lots of stuff because just there's money sitting on the shelf. But I don't know how you do it in your uh, scope of operations. But most do. So the question you have to ask yourself is, if our suppliers can't get us our stuff like they do every Tuesday morning or whatever the schedule is, what should we stock up on just in case? Well, I don't know, but you do. And a team of experts in your organization should. And if you don't, then you've got to talk about it. And consider what's the value of investing a little extra money to stockpile some of those essential things we've got to have. If you set up uh, contingencies, and you might want to, again, geographically dispersed outside the likely affected area, you're probably doing business with a lot of Utah companies that are all in the same vulnerable place along the Wasatch Front. The fault lines, the faction, the disrupted roads, and their employees can't make it into work either, so there's no one there. Maybe you should find alternate suppliers. And of course, the question is, how soon can they get in from Ohio? Well, one thing we do know is that South Regional Airport is built on big old rock. It's going to be one of the two airports within about a 50-mile radius that's going to be functional. I promise it's going to be pretty busy, okay? But maybe it's not too busy that it can't get in your supplies because you've made that agreement because it was that essential to you. I don't know, but you this is more for business, but vital records. And what vital records do you maintain? Do you maintain any vital records? Blueprints? Floor plans? I don't know. Schematics? Stuff that if the building burn up, where's the copy? Is it stored in the cloud? Is it in the safety deposit box? Is it 100?